Good evening. What a great video and what a very, very special person Ann Bowers is. Her wonderful gift comes at a time when we really need that type of support, given the phenomenal long-term growth of interest in computing and information science by our students. KB, can you give us some of the facts and figures about this growth? Absolutely, Martha. Interest in CIS majors has continued to climb. We have 2,000 majors now, taught by a small but mighty core faculty of 65. Our enrollments have grown six-fold over the past decade. And another statistic that puts this in context is this. More than half of Cornell's undergraduates take at least one Cornell Bauer CIS course. So the students are voting with their feet because of the incredible opportunities arising from CIS technologies and the impact they have on every aspect of our lives. The CIS vision, when it was founded, was actually quite unique. We recognized that it was not only important to develop technology, but it was also crucial to study and understand the impact of technology on people and society. To realize this vision, we integrated information and uh, science and computer science under one umbrella. And our peers are realizing that this combination is critical and they're trying to emulate what is called the Cornell CIS model outside of Cornell. This vision of CIS was at least 20 years ahead of its time. And it's particularly relevant now as we, as a community and society, understand how significant the impact of technology is. The Information Science Department brings together this societal impact of technology in a unique multidisciplinary department that considers technology and its impact on policy, law, ethics, and also its connections to the humanities, economics, and many more disciplines. In fact, the student growth is not only in computer science, which many universities have seen, but also we have seen the same six-fold growth in our information science enrollments. Information age economy jobs are ones that our students seek and for which they're hired in great numbers. Our postgraduate placement research tells us that Cornell students are well prepared, not only for the technical aspects of the role they assume, but also for consideration of the questions they encounter around how the tech they work on impacts the world, is safe for the world, and enables social good. Thanks so much. So one of the things that Ann Bauer's gift is gonna provide is funding for a new building. Let's start there. Tell us a little bit about this building. Yeah, we're very excited about this. The new building will double the physical space available to CIS. For those familiar with Gates Hall, I hope you've come to Ithaca or you should come and visit when it's safe again. This new building will be about the same scale as, the Gates, as Gates Hall and adjoining Gates Hall. And it'll be directly across the street from the engineering quad, which helps also build those connections. We're aiming to create an information campus where the baseball field currently sits. And for the baseball fans, rest assured, the baseball field is moving to a new permanent location. Work is already underway to ensure that this process is seamless and not disruptive to the baseball program. In particular, the celebration of 100 years at Hoy Field will occur before the move happens. But coming back to the building, this new building is crucial for our growth. Our growth has been constrained. We have not been able to hire more faculty, accommodate student demand, and embrace research opportunities that are space hungry because we didn't have the space. So the prospect of having more space unlocks our growth strategy and Anne's partnership is the reason. All three of our departments, computer science, information science, and statistics and data science will now be together in a space designed to maximize collaboration across these units. So the second home will give us ample capacity for small group creative collaborations, space intensive research, as I said, for example, in robotics and fabrication, important strategic areas, and flexible multi-use spaces for active learning and demonstrations to enable inclusive, interactive, and experiential hands-on learning. It will also integrate virtual participation, which we all know is very important post-pandemic, allowing us to connect to long distance collaborators around the world, something we expect to do more of in the future. So now, Martha, I'm going to turn around and ask you a question. Okay. One of the things that really stands out about Anne's vision is her focus on people. For sure. Can you say a little about the commitments Cornell has made to ensure that Anne's support helps people, particularly our faculty and students? Yes, yes. You know, this gift, as you've just indicated, will really help us grow our faculty. We've needed to do that, and we've been hamstrung because we haven't had the space for it. Our part. Cornell's part of the growth strategy is going to be to provide new faculty positions so that we can meet this incredible demand for our students. 
we are committed to hiring those faculty. In fact, as you know, six new faculty are gonna join us just this fall. And over just the next few years, we're gonna recruit 15 additional faculty members, something we couldn't do if we didn't have the new space. This new building is gonna let us attract world-class researchers and give them the resources they need to succeed through lab space for students and postdocs, through collaboration space for equipment. So, you know, the way I think of it is that Anne's gift immediately provides the space we need, and then Cornell will hire the faculty we need. Our growth strategy and its implementation is this partnership, and we couldn't have a better partner than Ann Bowers. And I'll also add, it'll also support student fellowships, which are critical for us to compete with our peers. We will be able to invest in strategic growth areas, robotics, and IoT uh, that requires significant lab space. And all of those changes together, I'm very excited, are going to make Cornell an even more exciting and fun place for innovation and research. And that's very much, we feel, Anne's vision for supporting technology and technologists, where we want to create the environment for the best people to do their best work. When it comes to students, it is in fact the growth in student enrollments and majors that's driving our growth strategy. So it's our starting place. And while we create a wonderful new space for students to learn and collaborate, we will also be working on providing financial aid for students and support for programs to enable particularly experiential learning. Opportunities which when paired with an excellent curriculum, which we believe we have, they'll round out a student's education and foster innovative thinking on the part of the students as they consider their own professional path forward. So we look forward to the partnerships with many who like and value the opportunity we're providing our students. And I'm going to now, you know, segue right into talking about people because that's such a critical part of this. Anne, of course, is known for leading human resources, first at Intel and then at Apple, where she was one of its first vice presidents. Martha, you've talked about why naming Cornell CIS program after Anne is such a fitting tribute to her career as someone who focused on the human dimension in computing. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, KB, it's a great question. You know, I find it a little hard to believe now, but when Cornell's CIS program was founded in 1999, it was actually controversial. The, the thinking very broadly was that tech was tech, people were people, and they didn't need to be studied together. But we felt differently at Cornell. And of course, in retrospect, we can see how ahead of its time Cornell's decision to create CIS was. But what we see so vividly today are all the ways that the needs of an evolving society influence the development of technology and the many profound ways that technology influences society. And it's been that evolution and understanding, which has been influenced in many, many ways by our work here at Cornell, that's driven all these other institutions to copy our model. It's, it's a way of thinking that's gone from being almost radical 21 years ago to being absolutely central to how the world thinks about the coming and current challenges in tech. And it underpins the importance of both leveraging the huge advantages of advanced digital technologies and addressing the negative impacts they can, that they can have in everything from deep, fake, deep fakes to biased AI algorithms. We at Cornell are all about connecting people and technology. And, and, you know, these examples bring me to something I know everyone wants to hear about. So KB, tell us about what's going on in CIS right now in terms of research, both at that intersection of people and technology and at the foundations and the boundaries of technology. Absolutely. So the emerging fields of computational sustainability, applying AI to create a sustainable planet and computational social science are both areas that Cornell pioneered and we remain the world leaders in. Today, I'll actually focus on two other areas that we're also leaders in, security and artificial intelligence, AI. So first, let's talk about security. Arguably, we're number one in security. Cornell is home to one of the largest and most visible groups of security researchers found anywhere, ta tackling both technological security problems in modern computing systems on one side, and as well as ethics, practice, and policy implications and implementations on the other side. So Cornell Bauer CIS researchers are developing new methods for identifying and addressing security and privacy vulnerabilities at all levels, from the individual to the global, and are creating new technologies and policies to ensure that future computing systems meet our security and privacy requirements, both as individuals and as a society. So I'll just talk about one initiative, the IC3 initiative. It's called the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Contracts. It's an institute across CIS and Cornell Tech in New York City, and it is number one in cryptocurrencies and smart contracts. 
It builds on our long leadership in distributed systems and has incredibly deep and strong industrial ties and affiliates. So that's just one gem in in many uh, in our repertoire. And the second area I'll talk about, Martha, is artificial intelligence. As you know, Cornell has great strength in AI, and it's your core research area. We have exceptional researchers in machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, and core AI. In fact, we're ranked number two in the nation in the field. And our university is led by a past president of AAAI, that's you. And that was, you know, the first great uh, flag we planted. The other is the current president is a CS faculty member, Bart Selman. So our, our audience may not know, but three Cornell leaders have served in this capacity, including you. So I'd love to have you talk about AI at Cornell. Well, you know, one thing, KB, that really has impressed me is, is that within AI, we have both excellent research and really broad impact. You mentioned Bart Selman. He co-authored the AI roadmap for the United States for the next two decades, directly influencing America's research directions overall in artificial intelligence. As another example, Cornell researchers have helped create the field we call it FACT, Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in AI, and have instituted our AI Policy and Practice Institute this kind of research is enabled by CIS's unique structure because it encourages collaborations between technologists and directly adjacent di disciplines like policy and ethics and law and physics and many others. And, and many, many startups, including yours, you mentioned me, I'll mention yours, Grok style on visual recognition. Many of these startups have spun out of our various AI groups. Our faculty have strong collaborations and engagement with companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Amazon and Intel, including leading laborates and all kinds of large scale collaborations. Yes, it is an exciting place to be for AI and then it's an exciting place overall. So let me talk about one other aspect. One interesting aspect of this new college that I have to call out is that it is the first Cornell college named after a woman. And as far as we know, the first college of computing named after a woman. I wonder if from your perspective, Martha, you can talk about what has changed for women in computing since you started out in the field. Sure, but let me first mention what hasn't changed. Women are still significantly underrepresented in the field. At the bachelor's level, the peak participation on women was actually back in 1984 at 37%. And today nationally, it's dropped to 18%. At the PhD level in 1986, which happens to be the year I got my degree, about 12% of CS doctorates went to women. 35 years later, it's increased, but it's only at 21%. And, and to me, this is really discouraging because computing and information science is such an incredibly fascinating field. I don't need to say that to this audience, but no matter what you're really interested in, there's a link to computing. I actually think that so many of the skills that I personally use in leadership grow directly out of my training in computing. So I learned about divide and conquer, and that leads me not to be intimidated by big, hairy, wicked problems, but to adapt and reuse solutions that have worked well in the past. I learned about iterative refinement. Uh, that leads to me to not wait for the best solution, or as I'm always saying to my team, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Instead, get some good enough solutions and then learn from them and refine them. Computational complexity taught me that sometimes we're just not gonna get to an optimal solution, but, but I digress, I digress. What I really wanted to do was actually brag a little bit about the gender diversity that we do see at Cornell in our CIS programs. Across CIS, 43% of our students are women, and in computer science, as opposed to information science, 38% are women. And again, as a point of comparison, the national average, 18%. Underrepresented minority students went from about 20 students, 20 in 211, to now more than 200 in our major, about 14% of our enrollment. So there's still a lot to do, but we are leaders among our peers in these metrics. And of course, I do want to add that it's kind of cool to have our first school at Cornell named after a woman, being led by a woman, Dean, you, and a university led by, well, me, a female computer scientist. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to ask you a really exciting question. At least I think it's really exciting. We've talked about CIS past and present, and we've looked into the immediate future to where this new gift is going to take us right now. But let's look beyond it, beyond that. Where do you see the Cornell Bauer CIS school 10, 20 years from now? That's a, it is an exciting question. I'll say I want Cornell to be known for 
the Cornell CIS model. And now it's the Cornell Bauer CIS model, mm -hmm. where we understand that technological innovation and the societal impact of technology both need to be tackled together. We were ahead of our time in recognizing this, the world is recognizing it, and that message has to go out. My aspiration for the Bowers College and indeed for Cornell is to bring to Cornell the scholars and researchers who will lead the world on research in computing and information technologies and position us for positive societal impact. We need to grow and we are. We will expand our faculty to not only meet student demand for courses, but also to build these new technologies and solve societal problems in a very broad range of areas in sustainability, policy, security, health, food and agriculture, transportation, and more. These are all opportunities before us, and I'm so excited to have you, Martha, as a partner, and to have Ann Bowers as a partner. This is an exciting time for Cornell, and I enjoy the job. Thanks so much, KB, and we enjoy having you in that role. Now, before we move to taking questions from the audience, I really wanna thank everyone here in the Cornell Silicon Valley community for being such incredible partners with CIS and with Cornell. I cannot say enough about how much we appreciate your ideas and your input and all of the enthusiasm that you show for our students and for Cornell. While I think we're all looking forward, I know I'm definitely looking forward to being able to travel again, the need to move most of our events to virtual ones has actually opened doors to alumni engagement in a way that's been one of the silver linings of this pandemic. We've been able to bring our Cornell community wherever they might be back into the daily life of campus. Wherever you live, you can attend Cornell lectures and seminars, performances and recitals, and through eCornell you can take classes. And of course, we've been able to make events like this one available to so many of our alumni who might not be able to take that time to travel to campus or even to travel to the Computer Museum. Now, let me be honest, I really look forward to resuming face-to-face -face interactions with our alumni. I miss those a lot, but I'm pretty sure that we're gonna to continue to supplement those with a range of virtual events. And so I hope to see you both in person and on Zoom in the future. And finally, I wanna thank all of you so much for your generosity to Cornell and to your students. We would not be the extraordinary place that we are without you. And with that, I think, KB, you wanna answer some questions with me? Absolutely. All right, let's do it. KB and Martha, we have some great questions from our audience. The first one is for you, KB. You mentioned that the number of female students in CIS has climbed. How did you and your colleagues achieve that? As Martha mentioned, our statistics are very good compared with our peers. And this was through a really concerted effort on the part of incredible student organizations and deep faculty uh, collaborations with faculty mentors are very committed to increasing uh, diversity in our population. So we've got various unique programs. For example, we have CS More, which concentrates on uh, rising sophomores and aims to grow the pipeline of URM students in our system. We also have basically approached in a very scientific way. We have systematically analyzed every part of the leaky pipeline issue. Why do people leave the program? Is it, well, it's sometimes, you know, simple things. They can't find a partner. They get discouraged when they have partner projects and they don't work on the projects anymore. They drop the course. So we made sure we have simple things like partner finding at the beginning of the semester. And step by step, we have increased the retention of women and URM students at every stage of the pipeline. Uh, other universities are now emulating this program. And I, I like to think it's a scientific approach that we've taken to, to debug the problem like good computer scientists and information technologists and created an inclusive environment by approaching it very carefully and thoughtfully. As Martha mentioned, though, there is still much work to do ahead, but I, the strong commitment I see on the part of the faculty, staff, and students gives me a lot of hope that we can continue to make the kind of progress we've been making and increase our diversity, equity, and inclusion. Great. Another question for you, KB. What fields or subfields are important for the growth of the faculty at this point? So there are various ones. Artificial intelligence, we've talked about that. Robotics, security, systems and networks. The whole you know, uh, information age is driven by networks that are behind them, and we have incredible faculty or leading efforts in that. IoT, Internet of Things, cyber physical systems, and I'm sure Martha has a few she'd love to add. Well, I, I always go back to natural language processing. I think we're really on the cusp of that working incredibly well. That's great. Martha, you mentioned experiential learning. Uh, and can you say more about what you envision uh, in that regard? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, my interest in experiential learning goes, it includes CIS for sure, but it really goes to Cornell broadly. I think we've learned a lot over the decades, and we've learned a lot, especially this past year, about what kind of learning works and what kind of learning doesn't work. And there are settings in which the old style, sit in the lecture and take notes, works. I'm not saying you never want to do that. But we've learned that this idea of flipping the classroom, of having students do the reading at home and then actively be involved in the classroom, that that actually expands the amount of learning that gets done. We've learned that engaged learning where students go out and do what sometimes it's called service learning, a work in the community and then come back and under the tutelage of, of an expert process what they've done and learn from it. Um, we've learned that these things can lead to better learning. And so we're encouraging these experiments in alternative ways of learning across the university through our engaged learning program, through our active learning initiative. But the last thing I wanna say is that we're trying to do this in a very principled fashion. We're doing what I like to think of as evidence-based learning. You know, in medicine, we don't just throw interventions at people and say, oh, let's try something and then we keep doing it. We collect data and we see what works and what doesn't work. And across Cornell, we're doing evidence-based learning. In fact, we've hired what are called disciplinary-based educational researchers who sit in the units and study the impact of these alternatives. It's been really exciting uh, to see how this has been all put into practice last year over the past year where we all, every single teacher on campus had to change the way in which they teach. Some experiments worked, some didn't, but we're going back and reviewing all the data and trying to see which is which. Can you still major in CIS and arts and sciences? Yes, absolutely. So, okay. So we are not an admit, CIS is a college, but we are not an admitting college. So we get students from uh, three colleges, from College of Engineering, Arts and Sciences, and CALS. And we love actually the fact that we get these very different disciplines that come into the college. And then when they take a major, their, their computer science or their information science requirements, those are just the same. So it doesn't matter where which college you come from, you take the same requirements here, but they bring that wealth of knowledge from their original colleges, which we love having. So yes, you can still be an arts and sciences major and be in CIS. Another question for you, KB. If we're able to function remotely, why is a building needed at this time? You've heard that question before. Oh, I definitely have. And I'll say so much great research starts out through serendipitous interactions that can only happen in the same physical space. Um, like people meeting in the coffee line, Gimme Coffee, which is incredible coffee, but something we put in the Gates building. And we have the whole campus comes here and sits in our lobby pre-COVID. And that's how many papers have gotten written because people from physics are talking to computer scientists and then they go off and they write a great paper and create a new sub area that they hadn't thought of before. And they wouldn't do it if there was no reason to bump into each other. Right now, what we're seeing is we're able to get by, of course, with Zoom. We don't have a choice as a pandemic and you know the, the risks of going out are high. But we are missing out on all of the serendipity. And when we get back, to our post-COVID world, I think people are actually going to come back with a vengeance to try to build and you know, take up again those interdisciplinary connections that they were missing because they just have to schedule a Zoom call before they can do anything. So I think we, you know, we really need this. At our core, we bring together, particularly in CIS, different disciplines, training students in a rich collaborative research environment is what is important, and bumping into each other is a critical part of that process. So this building will help that happen. And I, I yeah, can't wait for it to actually be here, which is 2024, so we're still a ways off. For sure. Martha, how is Cornell Bowers preparing students for the workforce? And how can we hire those students uh, in great numbers. There's there's demand here in Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad there's demand, and and I hope you will uh, continue to uh, to to hire our students. Um, I'm actually going to kick that one over to Kavita in just a minute because she can tell you about uh, the the career services link that you can use to connect students um, um, with your with your companies. But what I want to encourage is that you just you think not only about hiring students but bringing them out earlier for internships. I can't say how important it is to give our students these experiences, to let them see what is a startup? What does it feel like to work for a startup? What does it feel to like to work for a big company? What does it feel like to work on the West Coast? Some of our students have never been to the West Coast. What does it feel like to work for a security company versus an AI company uh, You know, versus a hardware company? So in addition to hiring in the long run, please think of our students for, for internships. KB, maybe you can talk a little bit about how the, the, the sort of operational side of this. 
Absolutely. So as you know, we teach students skilled in CS, computer science, information science, and statistical, statistical sciences. So they have broad experience also at the intersection of disciplines. So they're very versatile. So it's a, it, with economics, communications, digital arts, engineering. So the best way to reach our population, post positions in Cornell's handshake. That's the student portal for jobs and upcoming career events. Post-COVID, and we can't wait to get there, we plan to reactivate our in-person career fairs in September or uh, February. So you can visit campus then and hold an information session, tech talk, or office hours. And these information sessions and technical talks are a really effective way to reach a large number of highly engaged students. They can serve as an important part of your engagement with CIS. And our student organizations are very engaged with that. They're an incredible group, and they're young and full of energy, and they're great to interact with. So you should definitely come and in- interact with them in that context. KB, a clarifying question. Uh, when will current students be able to transfer into the Bowers College from existing ones within Cornell? So they can do exactly what they're doing right now. Nothing has changed, which is that you affiliate with a major. So typically that happens um, sophomore uh, year is when our students transfer over. They've, they've taken enough prerequisites that they can jump into either one of these majors that they decide. And that is unchanged and will continue going forward. Um, I guess this is for KB2. Cornell professors authored some of the earliest cryptocurrency papers. The tech sector is caught up in recognizing this as an exciting area. Any upgrades on progress there? Yes, so we have Gunsterer actually has created a startup that uh, spun out of the research that came out of Cornell. And as far as I know, it's going gangbusters. On the other hand, we're delighted to say that Gun is coming back as a faculty member. He founded this incredible startup. It's going really well. He's going to come back. And my understanding is next year, he's going to teach operating systems, which is a core area of research and a course on cryptocurrency so that our students can benefit from all that knowledge and the real world knowledge he brings to us. And I'd like to jump in and say this is also an area where we see great collaboration between CIS and Ithaca and Cornell Tech. Guns is up here in, in Ithaca. Ari Jules is another expert down at Cornell Tech in crypto. We have a huge number of students in the in the Cornell Tech Master's program who is interested in crypto. And frankly, when you put the faculty from Cornell Tech and Ithaca together, which you should because we are one university, uh, we are frequently rated at the very top in terms of, of our offerings in in the cryptocurrency uh, area. So it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's really a, a, a pleasure to watch. So this is for both of you. This is such an exciting development that you've described. Congratulations. How can Cornell alumni get involved with Cornell Bowers College? Well, well, I will, I will maybe start with the what, and maybe I'll let KB so, to say some of the how. We've already talked about hiring our graduates. So hiring our graduates, offering them internships, also offering them advice. You know, I was talking with an alumnus earlier today, um, and he he's actually in the finance field, but he was talking about DeFi, decentralized finance, and how when he meets with students, he talks with them about their options and about sort of the pros and cons of going to a big bank versus getting into DeFi. I think those of you who are out there at the cutting edge in Silicon Valley can be talking with our students about what you do and about the different kinds of jobs and, and the pros and cons. So that that's one thing. Another thing is, is hosting events and coming to events and 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 meeting events and, and and again telling your story and how CIS has impacted you. KB, you might have other ideas as well. Yeah, the big one I would say is connecting up with our student organizations. We have uh, ACSU, uh, ISA. So ACSU is a computer science uh, association for undergraduates. ISA is for the same for uh, information science. WIC, Women in Cornell Computing, and URMC. And they, uh, I think connecting up and we can set up connections with any alums who are interested and those organizations. And then they set up talks, either they could be technical or, you know, talks about mentoring talks, et cetera. And that's a great way both to benefit from sort of the energy of our students and connect up and really build up uh, that intellectual connection with them so that you can maybe mentor them going forward. So one last question. This is a, a from a, another viewer. I graduated from the Graduate School of ILR, ILR in 1981. I continually see the marriage between people and the innovations they engage in. Will you be collaborating with the ILR faculty and students in advancing the work of your school? 
Absolutely. So I, I sorry, I'm going to jump right in and take that. So we, we talked about CS and IS and statistics and data science is a very unique kind of a department that I'm the lead dean of. So CIS uh, is the lead dean of that, but it's actually shared between three colleges. So statistics and data science is shared between ILR, CALS and CIS. And we all have equal number of faculty there. And we're looking at data science. We're looking at all aspects. ILR looks at, you know, aspects of labor market. How is the future of work going to look? Uh, and there's a very nice article uh, just recently Alex Colvin gave. Uh, you should go and read it up in the Chronicle. So there's strong ties through a shared department. And it's an incredibly nice model. You know, all the three deans work well together. And we're trying to figure out how we position ourselves in that space. So that's, yes, absolutely. We work closely with ILR through a shared department. In fact, I think it's fair to say, and maybe we can wrap up by saying this, there is hardly an interesting research project going on at Cornell that doesn't have some aspect of CIS in it, whether it's our work on sustainability, whether it's our work on digital agriculture, whether it's our work on computational biology, whether it's our work on digital humanities, everywhere you look, you see CIS. CIS punches way above its weight, and it's it's uh, just so exciting. And again, I want to thank everyone in the audience, and especially Ann Bowers.